This is volume 10 of a compilation of work I have previously done presented in a multi-volume format, in which I am highlighting places, concepts, and historical events that people have suggested to me. My name is Michelle Gibson. First, I want to revisit some suggested places I talked about and interesting comments and suggestions I have received from viewers, Volume 5, because of a place in Turkey that came up in my feed that looked like two places I had compared for similarity in Indiana and Australia. Karain is 19 miles or 30 kilometers away from Antalya province in Turkey. It is described as one of the largest natural caves in Turkey. Archaeological excavations have been carried out here since 1946. Karain Cave is said to have been used as a settlement for a very long time. What really got my attention when I saw the information about Karain Cave come up on my feed is the similarity of its appearance inside to Nawarla Gabarnmung in Australia. And I had compared the similarity in appearance between Nawarla Gabarnmung to the Seven Pillars in Peru, Indiana in Volume 5 of this series. Nawarla Gabarnmung is believed to go back 44,000 years as far as human habitation goes, making it among the oldest radiocarbon dated sites in Australia. It is described as a rock shelter made by tunneling into a naturally eroded cliff face with 36 pillars supporting the roof created by natural erosion of fissure lines in the bedrock. The seven pillars in Peru, Indiana, are held sacred by the Miami Nation of Indiana, which owns land on the south bank of the river directly across from the seven pillars, where they hold sacred ceremonies and heritage days. The seven pillars are described as having been created over the centuries as wind and water eroded the limestone, carving the rounded buttresses and alcoves. In Turkey, the Karain Cave, also known as the Black Cave, is located on the east slope of Mount Katran in the western Taurus Mountains. It is described as a complex of limestone caves consisting of three main chambers, separated by calcite walls and narrow and curving passageways, which includes rock-cut steps. There are also springs at the Karain Cave complex described as fine water springs where the Travertine Plain meets the mountains. Travertine is a type of limestone. The Travertine Terraces in Pamukkale in southwestern Turkey are called one of the most spectacular natural heritage sites in the world, and we are told made from the sedimentary rock deposited by mineral water from the 17 hot springs in the area. Back at the Karain Cave Complex, human habitation is believed to go back at least 150,000 to 200,000 years to the Paleolithic Age from the finding of part of a Neanderthal cranium there, and a documented continuous human presence for 25,000 years from the Mesolithic Age dated from 10,000 BC to 8,000 BC to the Bronze Age which is considered to have lasted from 3300 BC to 1200 BC. The Greek inscriptions carved at the entrance to the cave complex are attributed to the Greek colonization of Asia Minor during the Iron Age between 1200 BC and 600 BC. Other archaeological sites found in the neighborhood of the Karain Cave Complex in Antalya province include the Upper and Lower Duden Waterfalls. Interesting to note that the Antalya Airport is located between the Upper and Lower Falls. And that the Karain Cave Complex is right next to an elliptical track. Personally, I think these were all components of an ancient energy grid, but we have been programmed to think of them all as either one naturally made or two recently built infrastructure so those ideas are a non-starter for many people. So let's go on and see what else we find close by. Termesos is also close by, considered one of the best preserved of the ancient cities of Turkey, described as a Pisidian city. Pisidia was a region of Asia Minor that corresponds roughly to the modern-day province of Antalya. Termesos was said to have been built on a natural platform at a height of 5,463 feet 
or 1,665 meters in the Taurus Mountains, and which includes a megalithic stone amphitheater, what are described as tombs of the western necropolis cut right into the rock face of Mount Solomos, and a rock-carved relief of Alcetus with a missing face known to history as a general who had served in Alexander the Great's army, who was recorded as dying in Termessos in 320 BC. The faceless carving of the general is interesting to me because it brings to mind Petra in Jordan, which was attributed to the Nabataeans, an ancient Arabian people. Like Temesos, Petra is known for its rock-carved tombs and temples, in this case carved right into pink sandstone cliffs. Was the rock-carving civilization of Jordan actually the same as the rock-carving civilization in Turkey, and not actually separate and arising independently of each other? And which also has faceless statues. They are on the front of what is called the Treasury in Petra which was perhaps best known as the filming location for the Holy Grail Temple at the end of Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. Is this natural wear and tear over the centuries, or intentional disfigurement because there was something there we weren't supposed to know about? Like, perhaps, the Great Sphinx in Egypt with its missing nose. Next, EC in California did a quick map search of the prisons in California, and she found star fort footprints everywhere, like both prisons in Delano, the North Kern, and Kern Valley State Prisons, the Avenal State Prison in Avenal, California, at San Quentin, the oldest prison in the state, first opening in 1852, the Folsom State Prison in Folsom, California, which opened in 1880 and is the second oldest prison in the state after San Quentin, and the prison Johnny Cash was referring to in his signature Folsom Prison Blues song from 1955 and from where he performed live in 1968, Pleasant Valley State Prison in Coalinga, California, Lancaster State Prison in Los Angeles County. Wasco State Prison in Wasco, California. Corcoran State Prison in Corcoran, California. Pelican Bay State Prison in Crescent City, California, the only supermax prison facility in the state, primarily for violent male criminals. And Salinas Valley State Prison in Soledad, California. While I am in California, A.D. asked me to check out Paso Robles. Paso Robles was historically known for its healing hot springs. A.D. said there was a massive bathhouse downtown where a city parking lot is today. It would have been right next to where the Carnegie Library is located, which is right across Spring Street from the Paso Robles Inn today. The Carnegie Library in Paso Robles was said to have been built between 1907 and 1908 from a $10,000 grant from the Carnegie Foundation. The original Paso Robles Inn featured a seven-acre garden, a nine-hole golf course, library, beauty salon, barber shop, several billiard and lounging rooms, along with its famous spa, which attracted the luminaries of the day. But, alas, tragedy struck this grand hotel in December of 1940. A spectacular fire completely destroyed the fireproof El Paso de Robles Hotel, though miraculously the guests staying the night escaped unharmed, with the exception of the night clerk, J. H. Emsley, who suffered a fatal heart attack after sounding the alarm. This has been the Paso Robles Inn since 1942, which is also advertised as a haunted venue. The Paso Robles Springs and mud baths were known at one time to be among the most healing on earth, from things like psoriasis and arthritis, among other ailments. This is a photo of the municipal mud bath building in 1905. And the candy store that is at the same location today, with no mud baths to be found.
A.D. said the San Simeon earthquake in the early 2000s cracked open the hot springs underneath the parking lot next to the city hall and library, and they started flowing again. Then the cover-up began all over again. Next, D.B. suggested I look at Battery Point, a suburb of Hobart, the capital of Tasmania. First, let me say that as a kid growing up in the United States, the first and for many years only reference to Tasmania in my life was this guy on Looney Tunes cartoons on television, the Tasmanian Devil. The Tasmanian Devil was a cartoon character based on the real-life Tasmanian Devil, the world's largest carnivorous marsupial and native to Tasmania. The Tasmanian Devil has been classified as an endangered species since 2008. Like kangaroos and other marsupials, mom carries her babies in a pouch. Tasmania is an island state of Australia, located 150 miles or 240 kilometers to the south of the Australian mainland, separated from it by the Bass Strait. This is what we are told about Tasmania. Tasmania got its present name from the Dutch explorer Abel Tasman, who first sighted the island on November 24th of 1642 when he was exploring in the service of the Dutch East India Company. Its first European name, however, became Van Diemen's Land, when Tasman honored his patron, Anthony Van Diemen. The island was inhabited by Aborigines for at least 40,000 years prior to the arrival of Europeans, when they settled the island starting in 1803 as a penal settlement of the British Empire allegedly to prevent claims to the land by the First French Empire during the Napoleonic Wars. The aboriginal population of the island was almost completely wiped out within 30 years from the time of European settlement, during a period of conflict between the 1820s and 1832 known as the Black War, as well as the spread of infectious diseases. These are typical of the kinds of paintings of the Australian Aborigines that have come down to us from this time in our historical narrative. Now let's see what we find in Hobart and Battery Point. First, I have known for a while that there was an international exhibition held in Hobart, which took place in 1894. It was said to have been built on 11 acres starting in 1893, for the international exhibition that was held there between 1894 and 1895, and that the builders of it never meant it to last, having been built of hardwood and plaster and concrete to make it look more elegant. And it is long gone. The Hobart Cenotaph is located on the Queen's Domain, a hilly area northeast of the Central Business District. The Cenotaph is on what was at one time called the Queen's Battery. More on Hobart's historical batteries in just a moment. The Hobart Cenotaph today is the main commemorative military monument for Tasmania and is described as an Art Deco reinterpretation of a traditional Egyptian obelisk. It was said to have been designed by Hobart architects Hutchison and Walker after the firm won a design competition for it in 1923. While we are told it was originally designed to memorialize Tasmanians who died during World War I, it was later modified to honor those who had died in all military conflicts. Here is a Google Earth screenshot showing the location of the Hobart Cenotaph and Queen's Domain in relationship to other nearby places. Battery Point is just across a small harbor from where the Hobart Cenotaph is located and south of the Central Business District. It was said to have been named after three batteries of guns established there in 1818 as part of the Hobart coastal defenses. These guns were subsequently decommissioned, we are told, after an 1878 review of Hobart's defenses found its location would draw enemy fire on the surrounding residential neighborhood. So the location was turned over to the Hobart City Council for recreation and amusement. They were located in what is called Princess Park today, where there are a few above-ground remnants, but which are mostly underground. Like the Paso Robles Inn back in California, also reputed to be haunted.
the Alexandra Battery on a point of land further down from Battery Point and also said to have been built as part of the Hobart Coastal Defenses still has much of its original structure intact and is still accessible to visit by the public. The Kangaroo Bluff Battery was directly across the Derwent River from Battery Point in Hobart. The first railroad lines on the island were established starting in 1871. I think these were pre-existing, and the dates we are given was when they became operational after being made serviceable. Today there is only freight railroad transport in Tasmania, with the main cargo being cement, and no passenger service in operation. Now, why would this be the case? Today, in much of Tasmania, including Hobart, you can only experience the old rail trails by biking or hiking. The next place I'm going to take a look at was suggested by AP, which is Queen Victoria Building in Sydney, Australia. The Queen Victoria Building is described as a five-story, late 19th century building in Sydney's central business district, said to have been designed on the scale of a cathedral by the architect George McRae and constructed between 1893 and 1898. With its over 20 domes, and cathedral-style windows. During its history, it has had some different uses, but primarily as retail space, which it is today. Though the Queen Victoria building has been threatened with demolition at various times over the years, starting as early as 1959. Makes sense, right? More like, make it make sense. FM suggested that I look at the St. Pancras Renaissance Hotel in London. It is the front part of the St. Pancras Railway Station, which is a main terminal in London. The architect, credited with the design of the building, first known as the Midland Grand Hotel, was George Gilbert Scott, who won a design competition held for it, we are told, in 1865, and that its construction was completed by 1876 with four floors. This is an illustration of the hotel showing five floors, which we are told it was planned to have, but not built to save on construction costs. It is interesting to note in this photo of this massive building, you can see the slanted street and unlevel building features from the side view. The hotel has a grand staircase and stately hallways. Each room had a fireplace, yet at the same time, rooms did not have bathrooms, which we are told was a convention of the times. Apparently, the original hotel closed in 1935 due to outdated and costly utilities and the need for an army of servants needed to carry things like chamber pots and tubs, and instead became office space for British Rail, who had plans to demolish the building until it was saved by a preservation campaign though it sat abandoned for a while, starting in 1988. The building was restored and reopened as a hotel and apartments in 2011. You too can have an apartment in the St. Pancras Clock Tower for only £4.6 million. LR suggested that I look into Dulwich College in London. Dulwich College is a public school for boys, which includes day schools and a myriad of boarding schools. Dulwich College was founded as a charity in 1619 as the College of God's Gift by Elizabethan actor and businessman Edward Allen. In 1605, Allen became the owner of the estate of Dulwich, and somewhere in there decided to establish a hospital for poor people and provide for the education of poor boys. Between 1613 and 1616, a chapel, schoolhouse, and 12 almshouses were said to have been built. The Lord Chancellor at the time, Sir Francis Bacon, objected to Allen getting the patent of incorporation necessary to be considered a college, in which he ultimately received from King James I, and which allowed the College of God's Gift to be set up as an endowment, so it was able to establish an aggregation of assets to support its educational mission forever. The charity originally was comprised of a master, a warden, four fellows, six poor brothers, six poor sisters, and 12 poor scholars that were orphans ages 6 and up. Known as members of the college, together they were legal owners of Allen's endowment of the Dulwich Manor and Lands. The business of the charity was conducted on behalf of these 30 members by the master, warden, and four fellows, consisting of a chaplain, schoolmaster, usher, and organist. 
the Archbishop of Canterbury became the official visitor or overseer of this charitable institution who could intervene in the internal affairs of the institution. Interesting stipulations made by Allen included that the master and warden be unmarried and have Allen's surname and blood if possible. The Dulwich College Act of 1857 dissolved the original corporation. For one thing, it went from being called the College of God's Gift to Allen's College of God's Gift. For another, it was divided into an educational part and a charitable part, overseen by a joint board of governors. I'm going into the details about this part of Dulwich College's history because it seems very odd to me and makes me wonder what was really going on with this charitable institution that we are not being told. Dulwich College took on its present form when it moved here in 1870. Next, D.C. asked me to take a look at the Solent and Portsmouth in the south of England. The strait between the Isle of Wight and Great Britain is known as the Solent. It is a major shipping lane and recreational area for yachts and other water sports. The Hurst Spit projects into the Solent Narrows and is the location of Hurst Castle. The Hurst Castle was said to have been built by King Henry VIII in the 16th century during the years between 1541 and 1544 as part of a coastal protection program against invasion from France, Spain, and the Holy Roman Empire. Then there are the Palmerston Forts on the Isle of Wight, called a group of forts and associated structures that were built during the Victorian era in response to a perceived threat of French invasion. They are called the Palmerston Forts due to their association with Lord Palmerston, the Prime Minister during that time who was said to have promoted the idea. There were approximately 20 of these Palmerston structures along the west and east coast of the Isle of Wight, like Fort Victoria was said to have been built in the 1850s to guard the Solent, and is located on the Isle of Wight in a position opposite from Hearst Castle on the mainland's Hearst Spit. In addition to all the forts and batteries located on the Isle of Wight, other forts associated directly with the Solent include Spitbank Fort, which was turned into a luxury spa hotel with nine rooms from 2012 until its closure in 2020. Horse Sand Fort, said to have been built between 1865 and 1880 and was sold to a private buyer in October of 2021, no Man's Land Fort, said to have been built between 1867 and 1880 and also repurposed into a luxury hotel that opened in 2015, and it is apparently still operating as one today, unlike Spitbank Fort. And St. Helens Fort, said to have been built between 1865 and 1878. It is privately owned and not open to the public. It is interesting to note that periodically the tide is low enough to reveal an old causeway, and typically when this happens, there is a mass walk of people out to the fort and back. All of which were said to have been Palmerston constructions resulting from the 1859 Royal Commission on the Defense of the United Kingdom, a committee formed to inquire into the ability of the United Kingdom to defend itself from an attempted invasion. The coastal areas of the Solent are estuaries and have status as protected lands, like the New Forest National Park on one side of the Solent, which interestingly includes the Exbury Gardens and Steam Railway. And the Exbury Gardens are world famous for the collection of rhododendrons and azaleas of its Rothschild owners. The Isle of Wight area of outstanding natural beauty is on the other side of the Solent. The Solent is known for having a double high tide, having four tides a day, as opposed to two tides under normal conditions. It is also at the midpoint in the English Channel between Dover at the east end and Land's End at the west end, and when Dover is at low tide, Land's End is at high tide, and vice versa. Portsmouth is an island city located on the northeast corner of the Solent. The only island city in the UK, Portsmouth is located mainly on Portsea Island a flat, low-lying island that is 9.5 square miles, or 24.5 square kilometers, and is the most densely populated city in the United Kingdom. The Anglican Portsmouth Cathedral is located in the center of Old Portsmouth. This is what we are told about it. A wealthy Norman merchant gave land around 1180 AD to build a chapel to honor St. Thomas of Canterbury, a Christian martyr who had been assassinated around 10 years previously. Then the chapel became a parish church in the 1400s and a cathedral in the 1900s.
We are told that in 1932, a sketch plan was submitted by architect Charles Nicholson that would extend the church to the size of a cathedral and that he chose a neo-Byzantine style of architecture and that by 1939, the outer aisles for the choir, the tower, the transepts, and three bays of the nave had been completed. Then with the fall of France in 1940, work on the extension project stopped and during the course of World War II, the building sustained minor damage. Then work began again in 1990 to finish the project, and that between 1990 and 1991, the fourth bay of the nave, western towers, tower room, rose window, gallery, and so forth were completed, and the Portsmouth Cathedral was consecrated in the presence of the Queen Mother Elizabeth in November of 1991. Portsmouth Cathedral has two organs, the Nicholson organ, which was said to have been installed in 1994, the pipes of which had been taken from an organ made in 1861 by John Nicholson, originally for the Manchester Cathedral. Then the West Great Organ was added in 2001 to provide music into the separate space of the nave of the cathedral. The Portsmouth Cathedral is a short distance from Gun Wharf Quay. The old Gun Wharf started out as an ordnance yard in 1706 on land that had been reclaimed from the sea. Then the site was extended by reclaiming further land from the sea to create the new gun wharf around 1800. Reclaimed from what, I wonder? The definition of reclamation is an act or process of reclaiming, such as reformation, rehabilitation, and restoration to use. Now known as the Vulcan Building, the grand storehouse of the new gun wharf was completed in 1814, where a wide range of ordnance weaponry were stored, including gun carriages, cannons, and cannonballs, etc. Today it is the Aspects Portsmouth, the leading contemporary art gallery in Portsmouth. All of those pyramids on the front lawn are really interesting to me. Today, Gun Wharf Quays is a shopping center. Portsmouth is the location of the HMNB Portsmouth, the largest Royal Navy base, home to, among many other naval-related things, two-thirds of the United Kingdom's surface fleet. The Royal Dockyard in Portsmouth was said to have been founded in 1495 by King Henry VIII and are said to have the world's oldest dry docks dating from this time period. Dry docks are used for the construction, maintenance, and repair of ships and other water vessels. So the Royal Navy base and the Gun Wharf Quays turned shopping center are bringing Hamilton, Bermuda to mind from past research. This map shows the location of the Royal Navy dockyard that was located there. We are told it was built by the British Royal Navy in 1795 and was once home to Britain's largest naval base outside of the United Kingdom until it closed permanently as a naval base in 1995. Now it is the home of the Clock Tower Mall, hosting a variety of shops, boutiques, and restaurants. I know there is much more to find here in Portsmouth, but now I'm going to take a look at a place that was in Amsterdam in the Netherlands that was suggested by another viewer. This was the Palace of Industry. Described as a large exhibition hall inspired by the Crystal Palace in London, it was said to have been constructed between 1859 and 1864. To put this into perspective, this would have been in the same time frame as the 1859 Royal Commission on the Defense of the United Kingdom that resulted in the construction of the Palmerston Forts in the Solent and on the Isle of Wight, and the American Civil War, which began in 1861 and ended in 1865 in our historical narrative. There was even a large organ there that we are told was installed in 1875 by the famous French constructor of organs, Aristide Covaillé Cole. But alas, it was destroyed by fire in April of 1929. While buildings surrounding the Palace of Industry were spared from destruction by the fire, like the gallery, shops, and apartments, the main building was destroyed and never reconstructed. The next place I'm going to look at was suggested by JMG, which was the Fort Washington Avenue Armory in Manhattan. The armory is considered to be the world's premier indoor track and field facility. It is known for having the fastest track in the world, with more world records being set here than anywhere else. It was said to have been constructed in the neoclassical style in 1911. It was home to the 22nd Army Corps of Engineers, used to give licensing exams to architects, engineers, nurses, and so on, and even used as a homeless shelter. The campaign to renovate the building started in 1992, and since then it houses the National Track and Field Hall of Fame, besides the New Balance Track and Field Center, 
and hosts the largest number of high school and college invitationals in the world. I wonder what it is about the Armory Building that makes it such a phenomenal track and field venue. Viewer JB suggested that I take a look at Beaver Dam, Wisconsin. Beaver Dam was said to have been first settled in 1841 by two men and that the population had grown to 100 in two years and that it received its name from an old beaver dam nearby. The city was incorporated in March of 1856, the same year we are told the Milwaukee Railroad reached the area. This depiction of Beaver Dam was circa 1867. As seen from the air, how could that be possible, given the low technology we have been told existed at the time? This is the Beaver Dam Community Library. It first opened as the Williams Free Library. The story about it goes like this. In April of 1890, John Williams, a wealthy local businessman, offered to pay $25,000 to construct the library if the city paid for the land. Done deal, and it first opened in July of 1891. The library's design was said to have been inspired by Henry Hobson Richardson. I first encountered the Richardson Romanesque style of architecture in tracking a long-distance alignment through eastern Massachusetts, where I encountered the Ames Free Library. Henry Hobson Richardson himself was said to have designed the Ames Free Library in Easton. It was said to have been commissioned by the children of Oliver Ames Jr. after he left money in his will for the construction of a library. The building, we are told, took place between 1877 and 1879. Henry Hobson Richardson was also said to have designed the Oaks Ames Memorial Hall, which is right next to the Ames Free Library, said to have been commissioned by the children of Congressman Oaks Ames as a gift for the town of Easton and built between 1879 and 1881. The Ames brothers, Oliver and Oaks, were an interesting pair. Among many other things, they were co-owners of the Ames Shovel Shop in Easton. It became nationally known for providing the shovels for the Union Pacific Railroad, which opened the West. It was said to have been the world's largest supplier of shovels in the 19th century. Why would shovels have been so important for constructing the railroad tracks to open the West? What if the tracks were already there and just needed to be dug out? The architect that gave his name to Richardsonian Romanesque, Henry Hobson Richardson, was said to have never finished his architecture studies in Paris due to the Civil War. He was also said to have died at the age of 47 after having a prolific career in the design of mind-blowingly sophisticated and ornate buildings of heavy masonry. Horicon Marsh is described as a silted-up glacial lake that is a national and state wildlife refuge. I really think places like marshlands and estuaries were mud-flooded places that were ruined for civilized use. You can see straight channels in this aerial photo of the Horicon Marsh in Wisconsin. Just like you see straight channels in the Mississippi River Delta. I found this photo of what was called a drainage ditch in the Horicon Marsh circa 1914. These drumlins are found south of Horicon Marsh. Drumlins are the grooves in the landscape, said to be hills formed by a retreating glacier around 12,000 years ago. The drumlins in Wisconsin brought to mind Malum Ash, described as a limestone pavement in the Yorkshire Dales National Park in northern England. The definition of the word pavement is this. One, a hard, smooth surface, especially of a public area or thoroughfare, that will bear travel. And two, the material with which such a surface is made. Malum Ash is at Malum Cove. Malum Cove is described as a huge curving cliff formation of limestone with a vertical cliff face of 260 feet or 79 meters high and was said to have been formed by a waterfall carrying glacial meltwater also over 12,000 years ago, like the Wisconsin Drumlins. Wayland Academy in Beaver Dam is a private college prep boarding school with a student population of only 125 in the 2021-2022 school year. It was chartered by the then Wisconsin Territory Legislature in 1847 as the Beaver Dam Academy. Originally a Baptist school, it was renamed Wayland Academy after Baptist minister Francis Wayland, who was also an educator and economist. Wayland Academy Residence Hall looks like it might have had a steeple-like structure at one time, and there are below-ground windows at the front of the building. Examples of architectural component removal that I have come across include the Grand Theater in Salem, Oregon, 
which was said to have been built as an opera house in 1900 by the Odd Fellows and owned by them, and today has retail space, office space, and a ballroom, as well as still being used as a theater venue. And the Old Lewis Hotel in McGregor, Iowa, only now it's called the Alexander Hotel, minus the domes it had originally. The Wayland Academy Field House is located directly across the street from the residence hall. The circular Wayland Academy Field House sports a beautiful domed roof. When I saw the term Wayland Academy Field House used to describe a sporting venue, it brought Cole Field House at the University of Maryland College Park back to my memory. I grew up in Maryland. This image of Cole Field House on the left definitely reminds me of an airplane hangar as seen on the right. Historical photographs of airships and hangars are easily findable in an internet search. This is what we are told about airships in our historical narrative. Australian inventor William Bland sent his designs for his Atmotic airship to the 1851 Great Exhibition in the Crystal Palace in London, where a model was displayed. It was an elongated balloon with a steam engine driving twin propellers suspended underneath. Then, in 1852, Frenchman Henri Gaffard was credited with being the first person to make an engine-powered flight when he flew 17 miles, or 27 kilometers, in a steam-powered airship, and airships would develop considerably over the next two decades. The era of the airships in our historical narrative was somewhere between 1900 and 1940. The 1908 military science fiction book of H.G. Wells, entitled The War in the Air, was about entire cities and fleets destroyed by airship attack. And airships were used as bombers in military conflicts starting in 1912 and during World War I. We are told their use decreased as their capabilities were surpassed by those of airplanes. Sounds like the story we are told about the superior capability of trains causing the use of canals for transportation to become obsolete. Oh, and then we are told the decline of airships was accelerated by a series of high-profile accidents, including the 1937 dramatic burning of the German Hindenburg passenger airship which changed the narrative. Now they were not a safe way to travel, so of course they had to get rid of them for public safety. This is a good lead-in to the viewer's suggestions of the so-called fantasy arts of steampunk and capriccio. Steampunk art is described as a vision of the Victorian age that never was, where airships fill the skies and steam power and clockwork make everything possible, combined with futuristic technological concepts. Capriccio art is described as architectural fantasy in which buildings, archaeological ruins, and other architectural design elements are combined in fictional and fantastical ways. On the top left is an actual photograph of the view of Budapest and the Hungarian parliament in the background from the Budapest Castle funicular, and on the top right is the Hungarian parliament building. The bottom left is a Capriccio art depiction of London with the view of St. Paul's Cathedral in the background and on the bottom right is St. Paul's Cathedral. Interesting side note that the Hungarian Parliament Building in Budapest and St. Paul's Cathedral in London are oriented in the same direction. My guess would be they are oriented to the cardinal directions, like the Pyramids of Giza as an example. You even see this example of a beautiful, fantastical-looking cityscape included in this official portrait from the 1950s of Queen Elizabeth II and Prince Philip. I truly believe the real history of the Earth is being portrayed to us through these artworks. Next, R.G. shared information about the sinking of the Lady Elgin, saying it was so similar to the sinking of the Titanic, and that the Lady Elgin passenger manifest was lost, so the exact number on board was unknown. The Lady Elgin, a side-wheel steamship, was said to have been built in Buffalo, New York, in 1851. For almost a decade, the elegant steamship took passengers between Chicago and other cities on Lake Michigan and Lake Superior. Apparently, during the years she was in operation, the steamship was involved in a number of accidents, including but not limited to things like striking a rock in 1854 and being damaged by fire in 1857. Then on September 6th of 1860, the Lady Elgin was rammed below the waterline by the wooden schooner Augusta and her sinking has been called one of the greatest marine horrors on record. The Lady Elgin was on its return trip to Milwaukee, sailing against gale force winds when she was rammed by the Augusta. The Lady Elgin's captain ordered that cattle and cargo be thrown overboard to lighten the load in order to bring the hull above water. All of the efforts to try to keep the ship from sinking came to nothing, as within 20 minutes the ship broke apart and sank quickly. 
Of those estimated 300 people, most were from the Irish community of Milwaukee, including nearly all of Milwaukee's Irish Union Guard. The Irish Union Guard was an Irish militia based in Milwaukee's Third Ward. The members of the Irish Union Guard had chartered the Lady Elgin for a quick trip to Chicago. It was said that so many Irish-American political operatives died that day that it shifted the balance of political power in Milwaukee from the Irish to the Germans. Well, there certainly seems to be some parallels between the sinking of the Lady Elgin in 1860 and the sinking of the Titanic in 1912 that resulted in changing the course of history. The story goes that the RMS Titanic passenger liner sank on its maiden voyage in the North Atlantic Ocean on April 15th of 1912 after striking an iceberg, and it broke apart and sank two hours and 40 minutes later. More than 1,500 people died of the estimated 2,224 passengers that were on board, resulting in the deadliest peacetime sinking of a superliner or cruise ship. Also, prominent people opposed to the creation of the Federal Reserve were on board, including John Jacob Astor IV, Benjamin Guggenheim, and Isidore Strauss. Then on December 23, 1913, the Federal Reserve Act passed Congress and signed into law by Woodrow Wilson. It created and established the Federal Reserve System and created the authority to issue Federal Reserve notes, commonly known as the U.S. dollar, as legal tender. ES put together a folder of images and information for me about Ottawa, Illinois. The city of Ottawa in Illinois was incorporated in 1853 and is located at the confluence of the Illinois and Fox Rivers. He said this town has some strange and or important history. Like the city's Washington Square being the location of the first debate between Abraham Lincoln and Stephen Douglas on August 21st of 1858, the park was said to have been platted in 1831. And besides having a fountain and reflecting pool with life-size statues of Lincoln and Douglas situated in a plaza surrounded by limestone, the LaSalle County Civil War Soldiers Monument is located there, said to have been erected on September 21st of 1873. J. Oak Glover was the mayor of Ottawa in 1858 when the first Lincoln-Douglas debate took place. This is a picture of his home where supporters of Abraham Lincoln were said to have carried him on their shoulders after the debate in Washington Square. Glover's home on Columbus Street is no longer there, having been replaced by a parking lot. Here's another photo from the time of the 1858 debate. It was what was known as the Ames Home, with Lincoln and Douglas appearing in it, where it was located at the corner of Superior and Paul Streets. This particular house was said to have been moved from this location to a new location at 118 East Lafayette Street, which is actually right across the street from Washington Square, where the debate was held. At least that's what they tell us. William Dixon Boyce was said to have built a home in Ottawa in 1913. Who was he? Newspaper and magazine publisher William D. Boyce was the founder of the Boy Scouts of America, which he established in 1910. The story goes that he was lost in a fog in London when he was approached by a young English Boy Scout who led him to his destination, and Boyce was so intrigued that he went on to found the Boy Scouts in America. E.S. said there are countless Old World buildings and Victorian-era-style homes, though it seems much of it was destroyed or heavily modified from its original ornate design. E.S. also said the captions alone given in these images raised some eyebrows with some common themes, like fires and war fundraisers, etc. He included an obituary he found for the man his relatives told him owned the largest home in town, which has been demolished, and the local department store, Sidney Stiefel. It seems that Stanley Stiefel's father started the business in 1899, and before that his grandfather was a clothing manufacturer in Germany. The fact that he was a Shriner and also an Elk caught E.S.'s attention, especially since each group has a lodge right in the heart of downtown. This is a photo of the Ottawa Knights Templar, circa the 1870s. Knight Templar is the highest degree in the York Rite of Freemasonry. The photo of the Ottawa Knights Templar was said to have been taken in front of the Opera House. Since an exact year is not specified for the photo, it is interesting to note that the first opera house in Ottawa was said to have been built in 1872 and burned down in 1874. Then the second opera house was said to have been completed in 1875. It was demolished at some point after this photo was taken in 1893 as part of a series of photos showcasing Ottawa. 
This was a framed photo E.S. saw in a local funeral home of the Civil War General George B. McClellan, showing the Masonic pose of the hidden hand. The hidden hand refers to the pose in this illustration, signifying Master of the Second Veil. E.S. shared several other photos at the funeral home. This photo is of an odd Civil War mourning dress ritual of the Order of the Confederate Rose. The Order of the Confederate Rose is described as an historical organization whose purpose was to support the sons of Confederate veterans in their service to the South. It was named after Rose O'Neill Greenhow, a successful Confederate spy who lost her life by drowning in 1864. And another was a group photo of the Improvement Council. If E.S. had to guess, he said this Improvement Council was a controlled demolition slash narrative group that decided who worked on things like getting the streetcars from horse-drawn back to electric. Electric streetcars started operating in Ottawa in 1889, and by 1901, there was an interurban streetcar system running between towns and cities. Interesting to see this undated photo of the streetcar in Ottawa on a dirt-covered street. We are told when the Federal Highway Act was passed in 1916, it marked the beginning of the end of the interurban systems. With the construction of paved highways and the mass production of automobiles, we are told that electric rail service decreased in popularity and that by 1934, all interurbans were halted. One last historical photo I would like to share from ES was that of the Clifton Hotel. Interesting to note what it says about the long porch with seating to view the Fox River and the drain pipe dumping sewage into the Fox River. Next, P.S. suggested that I look at Skeleton Lake in India's Uttarakhand state in the Himalayas, also known as Rupkund and Mystery Lake. It is at the high altitude of 16,040 feet or 5,020 meters and surrounded by glaciers covered by rocks and mountains topped by snow. It is called Skeleton Lake because there were hundreds of human skeletons found in 1942 at the edge of the lake. The remains of approximately 300 people have been identified. Studies of the remains showed head injuries caused by round objects from above, so the cause of death has been attributed by researchers to a sudden hailstorm. Regardless, who they were or how they died remains an unsolved mystery in the present day. Going on to the next place, S.L. encountered a step pyramid in Death Valley she said was near Rhyolite Ghost Town in Nevada. Rhyolite was a boom town that sprung up after the discovery of high-grade gold ore in 1905 and its last resident died in 1924. Today it is a place where ghostly-looking statues depict things like a Grim Reaper Last Supper. I went next to Spokane on DA's suggestion. Spokane is located in eastern Washington state, 18 miles or 29 kilometers west of the Idaho border near Coeur d'Alene. It is known as the birthplace of Father's Day because the idea was proposed by Spokane resident Sonora Dodd in 1909. The Northwest Company's Spokane House was established in 1810, a fur trading post that was the first long-term settlement in what became Washington State. And the Northern Pacific Railway first brought settlers to the Spokane area in 1881. The Northern Pacific Depot in Spokane, pictured here, was said to have been built in 1890, after the Great Fire of 1889. The 1889 Great Fire of Spokane was a major fire in August of that year, which affected downtown Spokane destroying the downtown commercial district of the city. Some of the things we are told about it was that it was due to a technical problem with the pump station, so there was no water pressure in the city when the fire began, and that firefighters demolished buildings with dynamite in a desperate bid to starve the fire. After the fire, architect Kirtland Kelsey Cutter was credited with designing many of the city's older Romanesque revival-style buildings, like the First National Bank, the Rookery Building, the Spokane Club, and the Davenport Hotel and Restaurant. Spokane's Riverfront Park occupies 100 acres or 40 hectares along the Spokane River, encompassing the Upper Spokane Falls. Officially opening in 1978, Riverfront Park is said to be located on the site of a former rail yard. Attractions include the Great Northern Clock Tower. The clock tower is all that remains of what was the Great Northern Depot, which was leveled to make room for the Expo 74 that was held in Spokane. The Great Northern Depot and clock tower was said to have been built between 1892 and 1902. The clock tower was almost leveled too, but was saved by a successful preservation effort.
The Monroe Street Bridge is a deck arch bridge that spans the Spokane River and was said to have been built in 1911 by the city of Spokane and designed by city engineer John Chester Ralston. Just a sample of the many things Spokane has to offer regarding the historical narrative that jumped right out at me. The last place I'm going to look at is Barrow in Furness in Lancashire, England, a place E.K. brought to my attention. It was first incorporated as a municipal borough in 1867. The Barrow in Furness Town Hall and Clock Tower was said to have opened in 1887. The Furness Railway opened in 1846, and by 1850, extensive hematite deposits were found of sufficient size to open a steel mill. That led to the creation of the Barrow Hematite Steel Company, a major iron and steel producer based here between 1859 and 1963. By the beginning of the 20th century, it was the largest steel mill in the world. With Barrow's location and steel supply, the Vickers shipyard here developed into a significant producer of naval vessels, including submarines. Vickers was also credited with making the first rigid airship known as R-1, or Mayfly, in 1908. But unfortunately, it was destroyed by mishandling in the process of being moored. By 1921, there were said to have been 80 dirigibles constructed here. In 1930, land for the construction of a second airship facility had been purchased on Walney Island. It was turned into an airfield in 1940 with the onset of World War II, with multiple uses by the Royal Air Force, including those involving airships. The Walney Airfield was used extensively during World War II, after which time it fell into disuse again until the 1980s, when it was used for passenger service by different airlines on and off again until March of 1992. I'm going to end Places and Topics Suggested by Viewers, Volume 10 here on Walney Island in Lancashire, and more to come.